Check, check, check. Okay, looks like we're good. Chapter 19. Approaching the Speed of Light. It is not everyone who calls his mother mama, especially in front of strangers. Boys over 15 and under 30 are ashamed of the word. But Vadim, Boris, and Yuri Zatsirko had never been ashamed of their mama. While their father was alive, they had all loved her, and after he was shot, they loved her all the more. With only short gaps between their ages, they grew up as three equals, always busy at school and at home, and not given to fooling about in the streets. They never gave their widowed mother cause for concern. Once, when they were little boys, a photograph had been taken of the three of them with their mother. Later, another one was taken for comparison. Then it became a rule that every two years she would take them to be photographed. Later, they did it with a camera of their own, and picture after picture was stuck into the family album. Mother and three sons, mother and three sons. She was fair, but all three of them were dark, probably because of the captive Turk who long ago had named their great-grandmother a Cossack girl from Zaporozhye. Strangers could not always tell which was which in the photographs. In each successive photograph, they had grown noticeably taller and sturdier, overtaking her, while she aged imperceptibly. She held herself erect in front of the camera, proud of this living record of her life. She was a doctor, well known in her town, who had earned widespread gratitude, expressed in the form of pies, pastries, and bouquets of flowers. If she had accomplished nothing else, to have reared these three sons would have been sufficient justification for any woman's life. All three of them had been to the same polytechnic. The eldest had studied geology, the middle one electrical engineering, the youngest was just finishing his course in constructional engineering, and his mother was living with him. That is, she had been until she'd heard about Vadim's illness. Last Thursday, she'd been within an ace of rushing away from home to come see him. On Saturday, she'd had a telegram from Donsova saying he needed colloidal gold, and on Sunday, she'd wired back that she was going to Moscow to try and get a hold of some. She'd been there since Monday, and she must have spent yesterday and today trying to get interviews with the ministers and other important people to whom she could appeal for some gold from the state reserves in the name of her son's fallen father. When their town was occupied, he'd been left behind to pose as an intellectual with a grudge against Soviet power, and the Germans had shot him for being in contact with the partisans and concealing our wounded. Soliciting of this kind repelled and offended Vadim, even from a distance. He could not bear string pulling in any shape or form, whether it was using friends or claiming rewards for services rendered. Even the warning telegram that Mama had sent to Donsova weighed on him. However important his survival might be, he was not prepared to make use of privileges, even when faced with the boggy of death by cancer. But as soon as he saw Donsova at work, he realized that Ludmila Afansievna would have given him the same amount of her time and attention, even without his mother's telegram. Except that there would have been no point in sending the telegram about the colloidal gold. If Mama managed to get the gold, she'd fly here with it, of course. And if she didn't, she'd fly here anyway. He'd written to her from the clinic about the birch fungus, not because he had suddenly come to believe in it, but to give her some extra salvation work, to load her with things to do, if she'd really became desperate, and she would never go into the mountains, 
in spite of her medical knowledge and convictions, to see the medicine man near the Lake Isik Kul and get some of his root. Oleg Kostolgatov had come over to him yesterday and confessed that, to please a woman, he'd poured away his root infusion. There hadn't been very much of it anyway, but here was the old man's address. If the old man had already been locked up in jail, he'd give Vadim some out of his own reserve at home. Mama's life was a misery while her eldest son was in danger. She was ready to do everything, more than everything, far more than was necessary. She'd even go on a field trip with him, although he'd already had his girl Galka out there. From snatches of information about his illness, read or overheard, Vadim had come to realize that the flare-up of his tumor had actually been caused by Mama's overzealous care and attention. Ever since childhood, he'd had this large patch of pigmentation on his leg. As a doctor, she would have understood the danger of malignancy setting in. She was always finding reasons to probe the patch, and once she'd insisted on a top surgeon carrying out a preliminary operation. Apparently, this was the last thing that ought to have been done. Although Mama was responsible for the death sentence he was now under, he could not reproach her, either to her face or behind her back. It was wrong to be too pragmatic, to judge people solely by results. It was more humane to judge by intentions. It was unfair to get annoyed at his mother's culpability just because of his unfinished work. His interrupted interests and his unfulfilled opportunities, none of which, let alone the force that drove him to work, would ever have existed if Vadim himself had not been given life, through his mother. Man has teeth, which he gnashes, grits, and grinds. But look at plants. They have no teeth, and they grow and die peacefully. Although Vadim forgave his mother, he could not forgive the circumstances. He was not prepared to concede a single inch of his epithelium, and he could not help grinding his teeth. This damn illness had cut right across his life, mowing him down at the crucial moment. True, ever since childhood, he had had a sort of foreboding that he would be short of time. It made him nervous when guests or women neighbors came to the house and chattered, taking up Mama's time and his. It exasperated him at school and college when the students were always told to assemble for class, an excursion, a party, or a demonstration an hour or two earlier than necessary on the theory that they were bound to be late. Vadim could never stand the half-hour news bulletins on the radio. What was essential or important could easily have been fitted into five minutes. The rest was padding. It made him mad to think that whenever he went to a shop, there was a ten-to-one chance of finding it closed for stock-taking stock renewal, or transfer of goods. You could never tell when that was going to happen. Any village council or post office might be closed on a working day, and from 25 kilometers away, it was impossible to tell when. Perhaps it was his father who had made him so greedy for time. He hadn't liked inactivity either. Vadim could remember his father dandling him between his knees and saying, Vadka, if you don't know how to make use of a minute, you'll fritter away an hour, then a day, and then your whole life. No, it wasn't only that. From his earliest days, this demonic, insatiable hunger for time had been part of his makeup, quite apart from his father's influence. The moment he was bored playing a game with the other boys, he never hung around the gate with them, but left at once, paying scant attention to their mockery. If a book struck him as vapid, he would throw it down and go and find something meatier. If the opening scenes of a film were a bit stupid, you can never find out in advance what a film's going to be like. They don't let you know on purpose. 
disdaining the waste of money, he'd bang his seat behind him and leave to save time and prevent his mind from being contaminated. He was driven frantic by teachers who spent 10 minutes droning at class and then were unable to cope with the explanations, patting them out or making a complete mess of them, and finally setting the homework after the bell had gone. They just couldn't conceive of one of their pupils planning his break more exactly than they'd planned their lessons. As a child, without being conscious of it, perhaps he had sensed a vague danger. Totally innocent, from the very beginning, he had been under attack from this pigmented patch. As a boy, he was always saving time, and he passed on this miserliness to his brothers. He was reading grown-up books before he went to school, and by the sixth grade, he built himself a chemical laboratory at home. All the time, he was running a race against the tumor to come, but racing in the dark since he couldn't see where the enemy was. But the enemy was all-seeing, and at the best moment of his life, it pounced on him with its fangs. It wasn't a disease. It was a snake. Even its name was snake-like. Melanoblastoma. Vadim didn't even notice when it began. It was during the expedition to the Altai Mountains. The patch began to harden, and then it gave him pain. It burst and seemed to get better, then it started hardening again. It rubbed against his clothes until walking became almost intolerable. But he didn't write to Mama, and he didn't give up his work, because he was collecting the first batch of materials which it was essential to take to Moscow. Their expedition was to investigate radioactive water. Their brief did not include work on ore deposits, but Vadim unusually well-read for his age, and especially well up in chemistry, a subject not all geologists are versed in, either foresaw or else knew intuitively that a new method of discovering ore deposits was about to be hatched. The expedition leader started to cut up rough over the trend of his work. He had to stick to his brief. Vadim asked to be sent to Moscow on business but the leader refused to send him. Then Vadim produced his tumor. He got a sick leave certificate and turned up at the clinic where he learned about the diagnosis and was ordered straight to bed. Although they told him his case couldn't wait, he took his hospitalization certificate and at once flew to Moscow in hope of seeing Cheraskorodrasev at a conference taking place at the time. Vadim had never met Cheregorodsev, he had merely read his textbook and other books. People warned him that Cheregorodsev wouldn't listen to more than one sentence. One sentence was all he needed to decide whether or not to speak to someone. Vadim spent the whole journey to Moscow planning his sentence. He was introduced to Cheregorodsev on his way into the cafeteria in the interval. He fired off his sentence, and Cheregorodsev turned back from the cafeteria, took him by the elbow, and led him away. Their conversation seemed extremely intense to Vadim. It lasted five minutes and was complicated. He had rushed through his piece without missing a word of the answers, and display his erudition without explaining the idea in detail, since he wanted to keep the main secret to himself. Cheregorodsev poured out objections, all of them going to show that radioactive water was not a direct indication of ore deposits and that it would be pointless to use it as a basis for search. In spite of what he had said, though, he seemed very ready to be persuaded otherwise. He waited a minute for Vadim to persuade him, but when he didn't, he let him go. Vadim had the impression that an entire Moscow Institute had latched on to the problem while he was pottering about on his own, trying to solve it among the pebbles of the Altai Mountains. He couldn't expect anything better for the time being. He had to get down 
to the real work now. He had to get down to the hospital business, too, and confide in Mama. He could have gone to Novo Cherkask, but he liked it here, and it was closer to his mountains. Radioactive water and ore deposits weren't the only things he learned about in Moscow. He learned, too, that people with melanoblastoma died invariably. They rarely lived as much as a year, usually only eight months. He became like a moving body, approaching the speed of light. His time and his mass were becoming different from those of other people. His time was increasing in capacity, his mass in penetration. His years were being compressed into weeks, his days into minutes. All his life, he'd been in a hurry, but now he was really starting to run. Any fool can become a doctor of science if he lives 60 years in peace and quiet. But what can one do in 27? 27 had been Lermontov's age. Lermontov hadn't wanted to die either. Asterisk next to Lermontov. Mikhail Lermontov, 1814 to 1841, the greatest writer of Russian Romanticism who was killed in a duel. 27 had been Lermontov's age. Lermontov hadn't wanted to die either. Vadim knew he looked a bit like Lermontov. They were both short, both had pitch black hair, a slight slender build, and small hands. But Vadim had no mustache. Still, Lermontov had carved himself a niche in our memory not just for a hundred years, but forever. Being an intellectual, Vadim had to find a formula for living with the panther of death couched beside him in the same hospital bed, for living next to it like a neighbor. How could he live through the remaining months and make them fruitful if they were only months? He had to analyze death as a new and unexpected factor in his life. After the analysis, he'd noticed that he was beginning to get used to the fact, even to absorb it as part of himself. The falsest line of reasoning would be to treat what he was losing as a premise, how happy he'd have been, how far he'd have gotten, what he'd have attained if only he'd lived longer. The right view was to accept the statistics which stated that some people are bound to die young. By dying young, a man stays young forever in people's memory. If he burns brightly before he dies, his light shines for all time. In his musings during the past few weeks, Vadim had discovered an important and at first glance paradoxical point. A man of talent can understand and accept death more easily than a man with none. Yet the former has more to lose. A man of no talent craves long life, yet Epicutus had once observed that a fool, if offered eternity, would not know what to do with it. Of course, it was tempting to imagine that if only he'd managed to last out three or four years, our age of universal, rapid scientific discovery was bound to find the remedy, even for melanoblastoma. But Vadim had resolved to dismiss all daydreams of recovery, or life prolonged. He refused even to waste odd moments of the night on such fruitless speculation. He would clench his teeth, work hard, and bequeath the people a new method of discovering ore deposits. Thus, he would atone for his early death, and he hoped to die reconciled. Throughout his 26 years, he had found no greater fulfillment, no more satisfying and harmonious feeling than the consciousness of time usefully spent. This, he thought, would be the most sensible way to spend his last months. Filled with the urge to work, then, Vadim had walked into the ward, clutching his few books under his arm. The first enemy he was prepared for in the ward was the radio the loudspeaker.
He was ready to fight it, by all means, legal or illegal. He planned to begin by trying to convert his neighbors and go on from there, to short-circuiting the wires with a needle or even tearing the socket out of the wall. Compulsory loudspeakers, for some reason, generally regarded in our country as a sign of cultural breadth, are on the contrary a sign of cultural backwardness and an encouragement of intellectual laziness. The permanent mutter, information you hadn't asked for, alternating with music you hadn't chosen, and quite unrelated to the mood you'd happened to be in, was a theft of time, a diffusion, and an entropy of the spirit, convenient and agreeable to the inert but intolerable to those with initiative. Epicurus, fool, with eternity in hand, would probably find listening to the radio the only way to hear it. But as Vadim entered the ward, he was happily surprised to discover there was no radio. Indeed, there wasn't one anywhere on this floor. The reason for this omission was that, for years, they had been planning to move that clinic into better equipped quarters, and the new place, of course, was going to be wired for rediffusion points throughout. The second enemy Vadim expected was darkness. Windows miles away from his bed, lights switched off early and turned on late. But the generous Dayomka had let him have his place by the window, and from the first day, Vadim had gone to sleep with the others pretty early, awakened and worked from dawn on during the best and quietest hours of the day. The third potential enemy was chattering in the ward. As it turned out, there was little, but on the whole, Vadim liked the setup, especially from the point of view of peace and quiet. The nicest of them all, in his opinion, was Egan Birdiv. He spent most of the time in silence, stretching his fat lips and plump cheeks at one and all in his epic hero's smile. Mersolimov and Amazhin were pleasant, unobtrusive people too. When they spoke Uzbek together, it didn't disturb Vadim at all, for they did it quietly and soberly. Mersolimov looked like a real old sage, Vanim had met others like him in the mountains. The two had disagreed only once, and then they had argued quite angrily. Vadim had asked them to translate what it was all about. It seemed that Mersolimov didn't like the way people had started messing around with first names, joining several words to make a single name. He declared that there were only 40 authentic first names, the ones handed down by the prophet, all others were incorrect. Amazhin wasn't the sort of fellow to cause trouble. He would always lower his voice if you asked him once. Vadim told him some stories about the Evenki, which fired his imagination. Asterisk next to Evenki, a small tribe living on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. He spent two days thinking about their inconceivable way of life. Every now and again, he would suddenly turn up with a question. Hey, those Avenki, what sort of uniform do they have? Vadim would answer briefly, and Amajan would sink back into thought for several hours. Then he would hobble up again and ask, What sort of standing orders and timetable do they have, those Avenki? And the next morning, Hey, those Avenki, what... What set tasks do they have? He wouldn't accept the explanation that the Evenki just live that way. Sibgatov was also quiet and polite. He often came into the ward to play checkers with Imagin. It was obvious he hadn't had much education, but he seemed to understand that talking loudly was bad manners and unnecessary. Even when he and Imagin argued, he always spoke soothingly. You don't get real grapes here. You don't get real melons. Where do you get real ones, then? asked Amajan fiercely. In the Crimea, of course. Where else? You ought to see them. Dayomka was a good boy, too, 
Vadim could tell he was no idle chatterbox. Dionga spent his time thinking and studying. He wanted to understand the world. True, there was no shining talent stamped on his face. He always looked a bit gloomy when an unexpected idea was entering his head. Study and intellectual work would never come easily to him. Still, often it was the plotters who turned out to be powerhouses. Vadim had no objection to Rasanov either. He'd been a good, solid worker all his life, although he would never set the world alight. His opinions were basically correct, only he didn't know how to express them flexibly. He stated them as if he'd learned them by heart. Vadim didn't like Kostogatov at first. He struck him as coarse and loudmouthed. But this turned out to be only the surface. He wasn't really arrogant. He could be quite accommodating. It was just that his life had worked out unhappily, which made him irritable. He had rather a difficult temperament, and this, it seemed, was responsible for his failures. His disease was on the mend now, and his life could be too, if only he'd concentrate more and make up his mind what he wanted. His prime defect was lack of concentration, and it showed in the way he wasted his time dashing about the place. Sometimes he'd wander aimlessly around the garden smoking cigarettes, or he'd pick up a book only to put it back down again, and he was too fond of chasing skirts. You didn't have to be particularly observant to notice that something was going on between him and Zoya, and between him and Gangart. They were both nice enough girls, but Vadim, on the borderline of death, had no desire to chase girls. Galka was with the expedition waiting for him. She dreamed of marrying him, but he had no longer had the right to marry. She wouldn't get much of him now. No one would get any of him now. That was the price you had to pay. Once a single passion got a grip on you, it ousted all others. The one man in the ward who'd really irritated Vadim was Podiev. He was a vicious fellow and very strong, and yet he'd cracked and given in to a lot of clerical Tolstoyan flummery. Vadim couldn't abide mind-sapping fairy tales about humility and loving your neighbor and your duty to deny yourself and stand around with your mouth open looking for ways to help any Tom, Dick, or Harry who came along, any slap-happy Harry or clever Dick, Dick, or anyone. Such dim, watery little truths contradicted the youthful thrust and fiery impatience in Vadim, his urge to unleash his energies and give of himself. He had sternly set himself not to take, but to give, not to fritter himself away, not to falter, but to burn himself out in one great heroic deed for the benefit of the people and all of mankind. He was glad, therefore, when Podiev was discharged and tow-haired Federal moved from the corner to take his bed. He was a quiet guy, the quietest in the ward. He might not say a word all day. He just lay there, watching mournfully, an odd sort of fellow. He made an ideal neighbor. However, the day after tomorrow, Friday, they were due to take him away for his operation. Yes, they were usually silent, but today they started talking about disease. Federau told him how he'd fallen ill and nearly died of meningeal inflammation. I see. Did you get a knock? No, I caught a chill. I got very overheated one day, and when they took me home from the factory in a car, my head was in a draft. I got meningeal inflammation. I couldn't see any more. He told the story quietly, with a faint smile, without stressing the tragedy and horror of it. Why did you get overheated? Buddy masked, already reading out of the corner of his eye. Time was flying. Conversation about disease always finds an audience in a hospital ward. Federal could see Rusonov looking at him from across the room. 
He looked much milder today, so Federau told his story for him to hear as well. There was an accident with the boiler, you see. It was a complicated soldering job to let out all the steam, cool the boiler, and then start it up all over again would have taken a whole day. So the works manager sent a car for me during the night. He said, Federal, we don't want all work to come to a stop, do we? Put on your protective suit and get into the steam. Okay. All right, I said. If one must, one must. It was before the war. We were on a tight schedule. It had to be done. So I got into the steam and did it. About an hour and a half's work. How could I have refused? I'd always been top of the factory roll of honor. Rysanov, who had been listening, looked at him approvingly. An act, I would say, worthy of a Bolshevik, he commented. I am a member of the party. Federal gave him another smile, fainter and even more modest this time. You mean you were, Rysanov corrected him. Give them a pat on the back, and they take it seriously. I still am, said Federal very quietly. Rusanov wasn't in the mood for analyzing other people's lives, arguing with them or putting them in their places. His own had been tragic enough, but when he heard complete and utter nonsense, he had to stamp on it. The geologist was lost in his books. Rusanov's voice was weak, low, but perfectly distinct. He knew they'd all be straining their ears and that they'd hear. As he said, that can't be true. You're a German, aren't you? Yes, Federal nodded. He seemed distressed by the fact. Well then, I've made it clear enough, but he still won't give in. When you were all taken into exile, they must have taken away your party cards. No, they didn't, Federal shook his head. Rusanov screwed up his face. He found it difficult to talk. Well, they must have made a mistake. They were in a hurry. Obviously, there was some muddle. You'd better hand it in yourself now. No, I won't. Federal was a shy man, but this time he dug his toes in. I've had my card more than 19 years. There's no mistake about that. We were brought before the district committee, and they explained everything. You'll still be a member of the party, they said, but we were making a distinction between you and the masses. A note in the Commandantura records is one thing, but party dues are party dues. They're different manner altogether. You won't be allowed to hold any important job, but you'll have to set an example as ordinary workers. That's how it was. Well, I don't know, sighed Rasanov. He'd been longing to close his eyelids. Talking was very difficult. His second injection, the day before yesterday, hadn't done any good. His tumor hadn't gone down or softened. It was still pressing him under the chin like an iron fist. He lay there weakly, anticipating the delirium that would rack him after the third injection. He and Kappa had agreed that after the third injection, he should go to Moscow but he had lost all energy for the struggle. He had only just realized what it meant to be doomed. Three injections, or ten. Here or in Moscow, what did it matter? If the tumor wasn't going to yield, nothing could be done. Of course, a tumor did not necessarily mean death. It might stay with him, disfiguring him or turning him into an invalid, However, Pavel Nikolaevich had not directly connected the tumor with death until yesterday, when Boneshewer, who had read all those medical books, had started explaining to someone how a tumor spreads poison throughout the body, and so cannot be allowed to remain. Pavel Nikolaevich felt a prickling in his eye. He realized he could not dismiss death entirely. Death was out of the question, of course, but nevertheless, it had to be considered. Yesterday, on the ground floor, with his own eyes, he'd seen a post-operative case having a sheet pulled up over his head. He understood now 
what the orderlies meant when they said among themselves, This one will be under the sheet pretty soon. So that's what it was. We always think of death as black, but it's only the preliminaries that are black. Death itself is white. Since men are mortal too, Rusanov had always known that one day he too would have to hand over the keys to his office. But one day, not this very moment. He was not frightened of dying. One day, he was frightened of dying now. What will it be like? What will happen afterward? How will life go on without me? He felt sorry for himself as he pictured the purposeful, vigorous life he had been living. A splendid life. One might almost say, knocked flat by this rock of a tumor. This thing so alien in his life, which his mind refuses to recognize as necessary. Death, white and indifferent, a sheet, bodiless and void, was walking toward him carefully, noiselessly, on slippery feet. Stealing up on Rasanov, it had caught him unawares. He was not only incapable of fighting it, he could not think, make a decision, or speak about it. Its arrival was illegal, and there was no rule or instruction with which he could defend himself. He'd grown so weak that he lost his civic concerns about what went on in the ward. One of the lab girls had come into the ward today to make up the electoral roll. Even here, they were getting ready for the elections. She was collecting passports. Everyone handed in a passport or a collective farm certificate, except for Kostoglatov, who didn't have one. The lab girl was surprised, naturally. She kept asking for his passport, and the insolent fellow started a row. She ought to know the basic political facts, that there are different categories of exiles. Why didn't she ring such and such a number to find out? Ask for him. He had the right to vote. That is in principle. But if the worst came to worse, he might not vote at all. At last, it dawned on Pavel Nikolaevich what a den of thieves he'd fallen among in this clinic, and what sort of people he was sharing the wart with. And this scoundrel had the audacity to refuse to have the light off, opened the window whenever he felt like it, passed himself off to the senior doctor as a virgin lander, and even tried to open the untouched virgin newspaper before Rosanov. Pavel Nikolaevich's first instinct had been right. That was the sort of man he was. A fog of indifference enveloped Pavel Nikolaevich. He hadn't enough energy to unmask Bone Chewer. Even the den of thieves somehow no longer repelled him. The hood of the sheet loomed before him. From the lobby, the rasping voice of Nelia, the orderly, could be heard. There was only one voice like that in the clinic. There she was, asking someone 20 meters away, Hey, listen, how much are those patent leather shoes? The answer went unheard. Instead, Nalia's voice came again. Hey, if I had a pair of those, I could get all the lover boys I wanted. The other girl didn't agree, and Nalia half gave in to her. Then she said, Oh, yes. That was the first time I wore nylon stockings. I really fancied them, but Sergei threw a match and burned a hole in them. The bastard. She came into the ward, carrying a broom. All right, boys, she said. They told me the place got washed and scrubbed yesterday, so today we'll just give it a once-over, okay? She remembered something. Hey, I've got news for you, she pointed to Federo and announced cheerfully. The one who was over there... He shut up shop. He bought his lunch. He did. Federer was extremely restrained by nature, but at this, he shifted his shoulders ill at ease. They didn't understand what Nalia was getting at, so she explained, You know, the poxy-faced guy, 
The one with all the bandages. It happened yesterday at the railway station, just by the ticket office. They've just brought him in for a post-mortem. Oh, God, Rasonov said pathetically. How can you be so tactless, comrade orderly? Why spread such dreadful news around? Can't you find something cheerful to tell us? Everyone in the ward became plunged in thought. True, Yefrem had spoken a lot about death, and there had been an air of doom about him. He used to stop there in the aisle and hammer on at them through his teeth. It's terrible situation we're in, he'd say. But they had not seen Yefrem's last moment. He had left the clinic, and so he remained alive in their memory. They had to picture someone who, the day before, yesterday, had been treading the floorboards which they themselves trod, lying in the morgue, slit up in the midline, like a burst sausage. I'll tell you something which will make you laugh if you like. You'll split your sides, only it's a bit disgusting. That's all right. Let's have it, begged Amajan. Let's have it. Oh, yes. Now you remembered something else. You, pretty boy, they want you for x-ray. Yes, you, she pointed at Vadim. Vadim put his book down on the windowsill, cautiously using his hands to help him. He lowered his bad leg onto the floor, then followed it with the other. Apart from the scarred leg which he had nursed carefully, he looked like a ballet dancer as he walked toward the door. He had heard about Podiev, but he felt no sympathy for him. Podiev had not been a valuable member of society, nor was that sluttish orderly. After all, the value of the human race lay not in its towering quantity, but in its maturing quality. The lab girl came in with the newspaper. Bone Shewer came in behind her. He was always grabbing the newspaper. Me, give it to me, said Pavel Nikolaevich, weakly stretching out a hand. He managed to get it. Even without his glasses, he could see that the whole of the front page was covered with large photographs and bold headlines. Slowly, he propped himself up. Slowly, he put on his glasses and saw, as he'd expected, that the Supreme Soviet session had come to an end. There was a photograph of the Presidium and the Hall, and the important final resolutions were in large type. So large that there was no need to thumb through the newspaper, looking for small but significant paragraphs. What? What? Pavel Nikolaevich could not contain himself, though there was no one suitable in the ward for him to address, and it was bad form to show such amazement at a newspaper item or to query it. In large print in the first column, it was announced that Chairman of the Council of Ministers, G.M. Malenkov, had expressed a wish to be relieved of his duties and that the Supreme Soviet had unanimously granted his request. So this was the end of the session which Rasanov had expected merely to produce a budget. He felt quite weak. His hands dropped, still holding the paper. He could read no further. He didn't understand the reason for it. He could no longer follow the instructions now that they were plainly worded. He did realize, though, that things were taking a sharp turn, too sharp a turn. It was as though somewhere deep in the depths, geological strata were beginning to rumble, to shift slightly, shuddering through the town, the hospital, and Pavel Nikolaevich's bed. Oblivious to the quaking of the room and the floor, in through the door with soft, even tread walked Dr. Gangart, in a newly pressed white coat with an encouraging smile on her face and a hypodermic syringe in her hands. All right, time for our injection, she invited him coaxingly. Kostogotov grabbed the paper from Rasanov's feet. Immediately, he spotted the big news and read it. Then he stood up. He could not remain seated. He did not understand the full significance of the news either. But if the day before yesterday they had changed the whole Supreme Court, 
and today had replaced the premiere, it meant history was on the march. Was it conceivable that the changes could be for the worse? The day before yesterday, he had held his leaping heart down with his hands, but then he had stopped himself from hoping and believing. But two days had gone by, and now, as a reminder, the same four Beethoven chords thundered into the sky as though into a microphone. The patients were lying quietly in their beds. They heard nothing. Vera Gengart was calmly slipping the embequin into Rasanov's vein. Oleg darted out of the room. He was running outside, into the open. That concludes Chapter 19 of Cancer Ward, narrated to you by Carter Banks. Thanks for tuning in to the Carter Banks Hour. Make sure you follow me on Twitch. Uh, that link is twitch.tv slash the Carter Banks Hour. Follow me on Instagram at carterbanks4l. Tune in tomorrow at 9 p.m. Central Time for Chapter 20 of Cancer Ward. Chapter 20 is called Memories of Beauty. Thanks again, and I will see you tomorrow.